Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We will give just another minute. We do have still some people logging in, I can see, and as soon as that slows down, we'll go ahead and get started. Just to make sure that you're on the right webinar, this is the Preparing Students with Disabilities for Career and College Through an Evolution of Pre-ETS Activities, Pre-Employment Transition Service Activities, and this is part one of a two-part webinar series. Good, it looks like our logging in has slowed down, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome, my name is Kim Brown and I am with the Montana Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center and I will be your moderator for today. This webinar is sponsored by the Montana Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center or Pre-ETS TAC and is funded in whole or in part under a contract with the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in today's presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the department. Please note that all audience members are currently muted. This cuts down on background noise so that everyone can hear our presenters. If you want to ask one of the presenters a question or make a comment, please type your question or comment into the chat or question box. And if you don't see that on your screen, look in the upper right-hand area of your computer screen. There should be an orange box with a white arrow in it. If you click on that orange box with the white arrow in it, it will open a drop-down menu that should have the handouts for today's presentation, as well as a place where you can put comments or ask questions. And please note that only you, the moderator, and the presenters will be able to see what you have typed into the chat box. If it's a question for the entire audience, I will go ahead and read that so that all the audience members can hear and then the presenters will answer. And please note that we will just have a question and answer period at the end of today's presentation. We have a lot of information to cover and want to make sure that we get through all of our presenters. But go ahead and send your questions in at any time, and then at the end of the session, we will read those off and get some answers to you. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Instruction Renewal Units when you registered, those will be emailed to you after the webinar. It can take up to a couple of weeks to get those emailed out. And please note that you do have to have pre-registered and requested those OPI renewal units when you registered for today's webinar. Unfortunately, at this time, we are unable to issue other kinds of attendance documentation. Today's session is being audio taped for the Prietz Resource Library, and the recording for the webinar will be posted to the Montana Vocational Rehabilitation and Blind Services YouTube channel as soon as possible. It can take up to a couple of weeks to get those videos posted. The address or URL for that YouTube channel will show up on one of the final slides of today's presentation, and I also will put it into the chat box a little bit later so that you'll, you'll know where you can go and access the archived webinars. The slides and other resources for today's session are available for download in the handouts area on your screen. And again, if you don't see the handouts area, click on the little white arrow that's inside of an orange box on the upper right-hand side of your screen. At the end of today's webinar, a survey link will pop up. Please do take the time to complete that survey. I think we have about eight questions on there. We read through all of the survey results and we use those to help improve the trainings that we're offering and also to decide what training topics we should cover based on what you need um, and what you would like to hear for future sessions. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speakers quickly today and thank them for their hard work on this presentation. We have Ellen Condon, who is the director of the Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center. She's also the director of the Transition Employment Projects and the Montana Deaf-Blind Project at the University of Montana's Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities, where she has worked since 1996 on transition and employment for youth with significant disabilities. Ellen is also a consultant with Mark Golden Associates, and she serves as a subject matter expert for the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor on the Employment First State Leadership Mentor Project. We also have Melissa Dadman. She's a project coordinator for the Pre-Employment Transition Services Technical Assistance Center, and she works as a project coordinator for UM's Introduction to College program for high school students with disabilities through the College of Health and Human Services. 
Melissa's employment background has focused on social justice issues surrounding poverty, housing, and education. While serving, or excuse me, while working on her master's in education and special education endorsement, Melissa participated in the Training Teachers to Ensure Achievement and Membership, or T-Team project, whose mission is to increase the capacity of schools and teachers to provide effective instruction to students with low incidence disabilities. Mary DiBiase serves as the geographic lead for the Prietz TAC with the Great Falls Vocational Rehabilitation Office and affiliated schools. As a certified special educator, DiBiase brings hands-on experience, knowledge, and skills critical to school staff. She also brings experience from her work as project coordinator with Montana Youth Transitions, as well as from her time as a job training program supervisor for Montana Department of Labor Workforce Services Division. Mary has experience with curriculum development and training for parents, youth with disabilities, educators, and counselors regarding transition services in Montana and how to teach employment readiness skills to youth. And our final presenter of the day, Roger Shelley, is another project coordinator with the Prietz TAC, and he has extensive experience working in rural areas of Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, North and South Dakota, Texas, Maine, and Alaska building capacity around developing self-employment as well as wage employment for youth and adults with disabilities. He has worked with people with traumatic brain injuries, intellectual disabilities, and people with dual diagnoses, mental health and developmental disabilities. Shelley also has experience working with Montana workforce agencies. And with that, I would like to once again thank our speakers and thank our audience members as well, and I will turn it over to Ellen and Mary who will start us off for today. Thank you, Kim, and welcome, everybody. Um, as the Technical Assistance Center for the state of Montana, we are taxed with providing technical assistance, training, support, materials development to, for voc rehab as well as schools and community rehab providers. And so as part of our work, we were asked to put together a progression or a description of what work-based learning and creats could look like for students over the years. Um, one that's based on individual students. How do they build on creats activities year to year so that they exit high school prepared to work or go to college? And the other thing in Montana, as many of you know, each individual high school has a contract to provide pre-employment transition services to their students, their eligible students. So our other goal was to provide some direction to each of the high schools about how do they build capacity within their own school to provide pre ups to make sure that they are preparing their eligible students. And for those of you new to pre ups the pre-employment transition services, eligible students are students age 14 to 21 who are enrolled in a high school program or secondary program and have a disability, either a 504 plan, IEP, or are potentially eligible for voc rehab. So what we put together for this webinar is we, we do recognize that there are five pre-employment transition services categories, which we'll get to in a minute. And just to illustrate that you could be working on several different categories simultaneously within meaningful activities, just to help get your head around, this doesn't have to be five separate things. You can combine the skills that you want to target for students and do it within certain activities and, and do it efficiently within your school or in collaboration with agencies. So what this, how today's progression is going to be displayed is that three of the pre categories that seem to be most relevant to work-based learning are combined. And within this progression model, which is one of your attachments, um, the author has identified which of the three pre categories that activity is most related to. So again, this isn't done because we felt like 
one category was more important than the other or less important. It was just to show you how you can roll them together to work more efficiently. So the whole idea of this progression is showing how each activity builds on the next activity to best prepare, prepare that individual. And although the path looks linear, because it fits better on paper that way, we don't want to recommend or imply that you have to do one activity before the next. Um, you know, this, this whole model might work better in circular motion for an individual. As long as that individual is gaining experiences and exposure to various work-based learning activities, that's the goal. The other piece that we really want to emphasize, um, and especially to, especially to be inclusive of students with the most significant disabilities, is that there's no prerequisite. You don't have to have certain skills to, you know, that you earn in job shadowing to be able to progress to getting to know a mentor in the community or participating in work-based learning at a job site for pay. You don't have to work, um, do, participate in work-based learning in the school setting before you move to the community. It's all individualized. The other thing that we want to emphasize is that Prietz are individualized services even though they may be provided with in group settings or two groups of people at once. These are also distinct services. They're not the same as what we do under IDEA for transition services and they're not the same as what Voc Rehab has provided to students in the past. These are unique services. And again, they can all work together to prepare students for the high expectation of employment and skilled employment in the community. So Kim, why don't you move to the next slide. So another one of your attachments today is what we lovingly call our pie chart. And it's a guide to what the federal definition is for each of the five pre-employment transition services categories. And these categories come straight out of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And so also in that document, we talk about different activities that you or your school could participate in for or create for students. And also um, in Montana, because schools have contracts and they have funding for pre there's different things that they could spend their money on also identified in those in that document. So for today, the three categories that we're going to talk about that are most relevant to work-based learning is job exploration counseling. So actually exposing students to the idea of work, what that looks like for them, and also what work looks like in their community or where they want to live post-school. Work-based learning opportunities, there's a whole realm of these. It might be job shadows, it might be uh, a visit to an information interview um, at a work site where they're doing tasks that are of interest to you. Um, it might be paid and unpaid work experiences either in the school or community setting. And then we, drop, we, we do know how to count. We do drop to number four because on the list of Priet's required activities, number four is workplace readiness training. So thinking about what are all those skills that students need to be more successful in the workplace. It might be soft skills. How do you interact with the boss? How do you interact with, with coworkers? How do you get to work on time? How do you call in sick? But all of these things can be worked on together in meaningful work-based learning activities. So I'm going to turn this over to Mary for more information. Good morning. Kim, can you move to the next slide, please? So as we are discussing work-based learning, um, Alan mentioned that we have three of the pre categories that are relevant to work-based learning. 
one being job exploration counseling, one being work-based learning opportunities, and the next being workplace readiness training. We want to discuss those three pre-ETS categories um, and embed them into our discussion of, or weave them into our discussion about work-based learning and how we can view um, work-based learning as a progression. And by that I mean work-based learning should not be looked at as a standalone activity or a, a series of standalone activities, but rather as pieces of a larger picture for a student's exploration of the working world and his or her place in it. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide, please. Work-based learning, when you look at it as a progression, it can really be applied to many different timelines depending on who you are working with. But as Ellen mentioned, in this context, we're looking at it relevant to the pre-employment services provided to high school students 14 and older with disabilities. And this is, so this is meant to be an additional perspective when considering how to help high school students learn about employment options and opportunities. Next slide, please. When discussing the progression of work-based learning activities, we want to point out that even though many of the strategies strategies and opportunities can be done in group settings like a classroom setting. We're ultimately considering the larger context to be individual outcomes. There's a few examples along the way about how this progression of work-based learning can be customized to individual student needs. Um, and, and we'll talk about that as we go along. But we want to make sure that we're, we're looking at work-based learning as, as a set of tools that we can use when helping individual students with their employment goals. And those activities may look different and, and happen at different times depending on what those student needs are. Next slide, please. So as we talk about the work-based learning progression, this is what we're referring to, and this um, is an attachment that you re that you should be able to um, to look at and, and download from this webinar. There are four phases of the progression. We're going to discuss each phase individually and what each phase can include, and some examples of services that can include or can be done for students. If you'll notice at the bottom of the progression, we have the pre ETS activity categories. Um, as we've mentioned a few times, there's three pre ETS categories that are relevant to work based learning. And in each phase of the progression, we have some examples of experiences. And you'll see numbers next to each example one, two, and four. And we tried to make that an easy reference for you. So when you're looking at what activities would apply to each category of pre um, then you have that, that key for you. So um, what we're going to do is talk about each phase of the progression. We're going to split them apart and, and give a, a visual and a, and a discussion about how each phase builds on itself and what that can look like. As we mentioned, we're not look, doing this as a, a one-size-fits-all approach, but examples of ways that this can be individualized and work for, for every student that has employment goals. Um, go ahead and forward. Thank you. So the first phase that we're going to talk about is career awareness. And this really is the foundation or the introduction phase to work-based learning. You want students to be able to talk about a variety of careers, to have some exposure to jobs that they may not that they might not have known about previously, and to be able to identify ways to get labor market information. And by that I mean how can they figure out how much a job pays? 
what is the outlook for that job? Can they find employment in their, the area that they want to live in? What training is required for those jobs? So this really is just exposure to the working world, exposure to what careers um, are available. Next slide, please. The other thing I want to point out with, with all of these phases, but certainly this one as well, is we want to think about these skills as lifelong skills. So even though we're talking about students that are in high school, all of these skills are going to be relevant to them no matter what age they are. So if they know how to research careers, if they know how to find labor market information, if they know how to find a variety of careers that might be in a, in a career cluster that they're interested in, then as they progress through life and they have to look for other careers or they need their, their circumstances change, then they have those tools of how to research that information. Resources that can apply to this phase really vary and, and it can include bringing speakers in to talk about a variety of careers. Um, I know one school that does MCIS work and that's the Montana Career Information System. So they have their students go through the, the interest inventories and they find the career clusters that they're interested in and they bring presenters for each career cluster and they they're, allow students to be able to hear from professionals in each of those fields. Um, so when you look at online tools, the Montana Career Information System is going to be relevant in, in all of these phases, but that's a great tool. The U.S. Department of Labor has a, a website called ONET Online, and that's another tool that allows for research on different careers and what they um, might do in that job, what the outlook looks like. Um, they have videos that give example as of a day in the life of that career. And then knowing how to access Montana Job Service, their website, register for um, their job search um, options. And there's a, so there's a variety of online tools that, that you can use. Job Shadows is another opportunity to start the the progression of just sampling what jobs have available or what, what's available on a job. And a, a job shadow is not putting the student to work, but allowing the student to go to a place of employment and simply observe what's going on. Career interest inventories are another way to help identify career clusters that they can refer to in subsequent phases. And so what do you want for outcomes in this phase? Simply want the student to be able to describe or show how to research career options, that they can give examples of accepted workplace norms. So if they've listened to various speakers, what can they talk about that they've learned for what's required in those um, occupations? And also in each phase that we discuss, um, Ellen is going to talk more about how we can apply these phases when we're considering um, students with more significant disabilities. So I'll turn it over to Ellen. Thanks, Mary. And a lot of the resources and tools that Mary mentioned that you're using for students with more flexible um, approaches to careers, you're, gonna, you're still going to tap into those for students with more significant disabilities, but how you approach employment might look a little bit differently. And I start with, as we're thinking about considerations for students with a more significant impact of disability, you know, I, I wanted to emphasize, like, work with 8,000 question marks after it, like, meaning me? You're talking about me? And I think when we look at the purpose and the intent of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, a big push is looking at employment in the community, competitive integrated employment for every student. And I think this is pretty new to a lot of the young adults who are still in school and who are now eligible for pre-eds. And it's also new to their teachers and to their families. 
So I think career awareness is really going to start with emphasizing we're talking about paid work in the community alongside people without disabilities for all students. And that's going to be a big piece of career awareness. And then also introducing the concept or the strategy of negotiated employment or customized employment. Because many of the students with more significant disabilities may not be able to go out and compete for a job. So instead of looking at job openings that are in their community, they're still going to be looking at what's in their community, but we also might start looking at, okay, so based on what we know about this student, what characteristics of this particular employment site match or don't match? Based on this student's interest areas, where do other people work that share those same interests? So those students are going to be doing job shadows, they're going to be interviewing employers about what they do, but they're going to be looking for tasks instead of job titles. And they can also do that through the Montana Career Information System, but it's going to look a little bit different. For students with less significant disabilities, they may be able to fit right into a specific job title, job description. For students with a more significant impact, we're going to be focusing on tasks instead of job titles. That's a customized strategy. And then we're also going to be looking at, based on what we know about them, what jobs and job settings are going to be a better match than others. And so some of the activities for these students, again, are going to be the same. It's going to be job shadows. It's going to be workplace tours. It's going to be meeting employers in your community, but with a, different, a slightly different uh, focus. And so, you know, I'm also saying, like, let's begin the process of discovery here. So really looking at who this student is in terms of where they're at their best, what supports help them be successful, what tasks they can start to learn so they can offer them to employers for pay as they get into some of the, the work-based learning. So again, it's going to be pretty individualized, but Folks with significant disabilities can, can participate right alongside everybody else in some of these other activities. So let's turn it back to Mary to hear about career exploration. So our first phase, career awareness, was learning about work. And the second phase of career exploration is also learning about work, but with a bit more analysis factored in. So Many of the activities in career awareness, the students may have more of a passive role, and hopefully in career exploration, the students have more of an active role. They might have more of a role in selecting what their experiences are. They um, might have more interaction with specific employers or professionals related to their career interests when they do um, occupation-specific informational interviews, for example. So this is taking the awareness of careers to a, the next level, but still with that intention of helping students analyze information, research information, prepare for their subsequent phases and, and figuring out what those career interests might be. Um, next slide, please. So in this phase, so many of the, the activities may be similar, um, but as I mentioned before, with a bit more emphasis on really exploring what work means. So your job shadows might be more geared to observing specific jobs. So maybe in the previous phase, the job shadows were to just observe work and get a feel for what interests they may have or what skills they might want to tap into. Um, and, and in this phase, the job shadows <clears throat> are going to be more specific to um, a certain career cluster or specific jobs. 
You can continue to do career interest inventories, and then you may want to add in other types of in inventories, for example, multiple intelligence inventories. That is another way to identify what a student's interests are, but also how their strengths apply to certain types of careers. Um, they will want to make connections with employers to do interviews and, and talk more with them about what's required for that job. Our outcomes are not just going to be looking at inventory results generally, but they're going to be applying those results now to meaningful planning and exploration. So when we start looking at the subsequent phases, we're really going to start trying to narrow down what some career interests are and what students might need to do to prepare for those careers to help them really get a good introduction and preparation for those. We want students to be able to articulate if there's training involved in the careers that they're interested in and what that might look like. Next slide, please. And we'll turn it over to Ellen. Okay, so again, we will, if the tools that we're using for everybody else work for the students with significant disabilities, we'll use them. Um, and if not, we'll augment some of those strategies to learn about interests and skills with something probably called discovery and some, some that looks a lot like, or it is one of your informal transition assessments. And so we may end up spending some time at the student's home and looking at what kind of activities they participate in during the day. And then from those activities, translating those, those, that participation into the student's skills, into tasks they already know how to do, and then thinking about with training, how could we um, increase their task list? Also, a really big um, part of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is Section 511, which basically says nobody under the age of 25 can go directly into a sheltered setting without basically trying out community-based work experience and having services from Vogue Rehab and having access to pre -ads. So part, you know, the ethical um, practice would say that if somebody's going to go try out work in the community so they can make an informed choice about whether or not they, they want a job in the community or they want to participate in a sheltered setting for some minimum wage, the ethical practice would be that it's a well-matched position so they can be successful. So I think you know, when you're looking at career awareness, like you're talking about, wow, we, we actually could work in the community using some alternative strategies. So for career exploration, I would hope that part of what we're gathering for students with a more significant impact of, of disabilities is a list of tasks that they know how to do, either from what we've observed at school or observed at home or activities with them in the community, but also, let's amp it up one level. Just because they've done this one task doesn't mean that's all we're going to offer for pay. It means that we can also provide training based on who this student is and increase their list of tasks. The other thing that I would want at this level of career exploration is basically a list of characteristics of workplaces. Um, so for a student who has mobility issues, you know, are there, what does the environment need to look like? What type of work day are they going to have? What time, of, what time of day works and doesn't work? What kind of supports or predictability or freedom within the workplace? I would want to start building that blueprint for what works and doesn't work for the student and then looking at specific businesses and tasks and saying, this would be a great match. This wouldn't be a match right now because of this. Or these might be some accommodations to start looking at. So I think, you know, after awareness, we figured out, we, you know, everybody 
is entitled to try out a job in the community. And then now we're really starting to look at, through the lens of who this person is and what they need to be successful in a work experience, we are going to look at which employers match and don't match. And so starting to build that, um, you know, and starting to build that recognition of the student, of the family, that they're going to excel just like the rest of us in some environments more so than others. So let's go back to Mary for career preparation. So the first two phases we're really discussing and, and helping the student learn about work. And now we're going to take the information that they discovered in those first two phases and start learning through work. So career preparation is giving all of the information that they had previously some real meaning. There's two characteristics to this phase that I want to point out. Um, first of all, their previous exposure to employers and professionals was brief. So the job shadows may just be for a couple hours or for a day. Their interviews with employers was uh, just a, an hour-long discussion with them. The tours are going to be a brief introduction to what's going on in that place of employment. Their current exposure to workplace professionals in this phase hopefully will be more extended. Also, the activities in this phase are to help engage the student more into the world of work, not as a theory, but as a reality. And all of the activities hopefully can reinforce that idea. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about what that can look like. When we move from some of the more hands-on work-based learning activities, we're moving from the job shadows, which is just observing work, to um, more extended activities, such as a work experience where a student has maybe a, a few weeks at a place of employment. And I apologize if you can hear the background noise. This, this is the moment that a train decided to go ply my office. So I think it is moving along. So I, again, I apologize for that. So work experience is one example of a way that a student can gain some, um, some actual workplace experience, figure out what work looks like, what it um, what it looks like to work with other employees, what it looks like to work in certain types of careers. Might also have student-run businesses if they're interested in um, entrepreneurship or, or doing their own business. Project-based learning or service learning is another example of taking some specific skills and working on a project where they can can really utilize some of the skills that they already have or to learn skills that they're interested in learning in a type of career that they're interested in going into. In addition to those activities, we can, we can do more instruction to support those employment activities. Things like Ellen already mentioned, soft skills. So what, do the what does the student need to know when they're managing their relationships with a supervisor or co-workers or customers that might come through the store or the place of business that they work. What do they need to know for financial literacy to support their, um, their earnings? So if they start getting a paycheck, do they know what to do with that paycheck? Do they know how to manage their money? Do they know how to start a business, a, a bank account and manage that? Do they know what a budget looks like? All of those things that can support them um, when they get into regular employment as an adult. What transportation do they need to learn about? If they're in a larger city or larger town that has public transportation, do they know how to access that transportation and, and manage that, what that would look like? Do they need to work on a driver's license? Do they need to work on other types of transportation depending on the place that they live and what's available to them? What kind of personal care do they need to learn about? What skills do they already have or what skills do they need to support a successful employment opportunity? 
So all of these activities, again, are focusing on really helping a student understand what work looks like by those extended opportunities and supportive activities. So let's turn it over to Ellen to talk about um, considerations. So again, we're going to be participating in a lot of this, the, a lot of the same strategies that Mary just referenced. You know, here's the time when students can go out and get their hands on work. And so to ensure that they're having a good experience and they're learning and, and optimistic about the opportunity to go to work, let's make sure we're placing them in well-matched work experience sites. Um, and then let's test out the theories. You know, we thought we knew this person was going to need much more prep time to exit school and get ready to go to work. But lo and behold, as we're going out into the community, we realize they're super motivated by this new setting and changing the context from school to employment site, this student blows us away with how quickly they move and how independent they are. Um, so that's what we're doing in the preparation, is let's keep learning about who this individual student is by exposing them to different contexts with really high expectations, um, and let's clarify what are the ideal conditions for this person to be successful. Like you start with the theory of what we think we know about this student and what they can do in an employment setting. And in career preparation, we're really testing out some of those theories. And we're learning more about, well, in an individualized setting, boy, their performance looks so much different than it does at school, or than we anticipated it would once we, once we got out in the community. The other thing that we can start looking at is, you know, how do we teach students to be more independent at work? So do, if this is a student that doesn't use a watch or doesn't understand a clock or a watch for time frames, how do we get them to independently transition from task to task? Maybe using picture cues, maybe using an iPod or an iPad. Um, let's start thinking about really preparing them to be as independent as possible in future community work. Um, the other really important piece that Mary brought up was financial literacy. For many students with significant disabilities, there's some really bad misinformation out there about how much they can earn before losing supplemental security income, or SSI, and also Medicaid. Let's make sure families and youth are getting correct information about Medicaid thresholds thresholds, meaning how much they can earn and still keep their Medicaid, and then also correct information about how SSI page or, um, monthly checks fluctuate based on what you're earning. And also, let's educate people about the, the many Social Security work incentives that support people to try out work and not lose their benefits. And again, you know, I would want in this phase to keep building the list of tasks we know this student could do or could offer an employer for pay with training. We want to keep expanding what this person, what in our mind and what in the student's mind they can do for work. So let's move to career training. So career preparation was learning through work, and our final phase is learning for work. So we were, our, we're taking it to another level where we have students that are able to really specifically have some ideas of what they are interested in going into, and we can start to customize our activities to support those employment goals. So for example, um, We'll have some of the same activities that we've been doing in the previous phases, but particularly in phase three. But the goals may be more specific on developing career-specific skills rather than just the exposure to work. So let's move go to the next slide, and we'll talk about what that looks like. We can still have activities such as the work experience or the student 
run or owned business or enterprise. Um, maybe having those exact or those activities be more specific to supporting the students' um, exposure to careers that they really are interested in. But we can also add an activity of exploring is there any or are there any credentials or certifications that would be helpful for the student to obtain? For example, if a student previously thought they wanted to work in a medical field but wasn't sure what that was, so they maybe did some job shadows um, at different locations such as a nursing home or a hospital or an x-ray lab or a county health office, a variety of different medical settings, and they started to narrow down what they were interested in and maybe they really enjoyed working at the nursing home. They did. Um, they might want to explore doing a work experience there so they can have some more hands-on um, exposure and, and skill development there. But during that phase, maybe they could get their CNA certificate or they could get their first aid or CPR certificate. Those kinds of credentials that are um, possible for a high school student to get that can support those employment goals. The outcomes of this phase are going to be more specific to, again, those career fields that the student is interested in so they can demonstrate some knowledge of the occupations that are available to them in that career field. And they m might have some more independence um, in either working in that career field or um, knowing how to explore those careers and what research they can do to um, get the training and the, the skill development that they'll need to pursue. So we'll move to Ellen to talk more about considerations at this phase. Excellent. So thinking about the, the, the three areas that Mary just emphasized, thinking about credential programs um, or specific occupation training or technical schools that focus on areas of a student's interest. If we have a student who isn't going to be able to do the entire certificate program, can we negotiate that they participate to gain specific skills out of that program? So for an, in, you know, for an example, in Maryland years ago, um, two students who weren't going to participate in the entire computer software design technical program actually enrolled in the program and got really skilled at doing specific tasks on the computer. And so they were able to build skills and tasks that they could then offer to employers for pay by participating in that program just in a more individualized way. So that's one option. The other thing to think about is, again, work experiences and looking at how do we explore? So say we, you know, this is a student who's always told us that he wants to be a police officer. And based on what we've learned about what the requirements and prerequisites are for getting into the academy, this person isn't going to do well with that specific track. However, let's do experiences out in community work settings where that student can learn about what are the other tasks that you could do? What are the other locations where you could participate and work alongside people in police careers? So let's expand what they're doing for work experiences, build their skill level and list of skills and contributions that they could make to employers within their skill level. The other thing we might look at is Say the person's really interested in working on cars, and we found this out through some job shadowing and some previous work experiences. Have we met somebody in the community that could be a mentor to this individual and provide some career training and some task training so that as this person goes out to um, negotiate their first paid job as they're exiting high school, they have additional skills that they can trade for credentials if that's not the path they're taking for career preparation. 
some of the outcomes that I would want to see for students with more significant disabilities at this phase would be, have they put together a visual resume so that a job developer can represent them to employers if they're going to pursue a negotiated individualized job upon graduation. Another piece would be making sure that all the information that we've learned about them and what works and what doesn't work is captured in some kind of document. Um, one example would be a vocational profile that is a document that Mark Golden Associates uses for employment. But something that really puts all this information together to travel with that student if that student really needs an individualized approach to employment to be successful. And let's turn it back over to Mary. So before we move into our case studies, I just wanted to point out that there are some items that you can consider throughout all of the phases. One example of this is soft skills instructions. What does the student need to know in each of those environments that they're participating in? whether it's a job shadow or work experience, or even a career cluster that they're interested in. What, what would that workplace setting look like? What does the culture look like? What are those skills that he or she needs to have to really be successful? Um, communication can look differently in, in a variety of different careers, so we want to make sure that students are prepared no matter what phase they're working on. And another thing to consider here is, as we know as professionals, the circumstances that we come across sometimes catch us by surprise. And so if we're working with students and can talk about each of those um, circumstances or, or interactions that they've had with coworkers or customers, um, we can help them keep building on those skills that they'll need um, in future employment. Are there any assistive technology concerns that we need to be addressing through each of the phases? And this can include what their effective communication tools are. Is timeliness an issue and we need to, to teach some of those skills? Is there curriculum that they need to learn in each of the phases that we need to make sure is accessible to them? If they're working on any of those credentials that we talked about previously, are there accessibility issues there that we need to make sure that we're helping them with and, and uh, making sure they have the skills that they need? Another area that we haven't really talked about too much yet is making sure that we have learning objectives for each phase and how is that information going to be used. We want to ensure that there's reasons for completing for each work-based learning activity, not just to, to check a box to say that it's done, but to have a reason for doing it and to have a good plan in place for how that information is going to be used to guide our next steps or our next phases. We want to make sure that there's meaningful information to the student as they're going through and they're they can evaluate each phase and they can evaluate each experience and um, have that information be usable to them. And we also want to make sure that we're using that information to help them progress through work-based learning and not just getting stopped at some point along the way. And along what um, Ellen was saying previously, another thing that isn't on this slide but something that we can consider through each of the phases is can we de be developing a portfolio that captures the skills that they're developing through each phase and also are there references and contacts that they can be capturing so that when they're ready to complete resumes or applications down the line they have that information. And there's all sorts of things that can be um, captured in those portfolios, but it's probably something we're going to want to um, have available to our, our whole work-based learning um, progression. So I'm going to turn the um, mic over to Melissa, and she's going to talk about our first case study that um, will we'll be able to show the progression for an individual student. Thank you, Mary and Ellen. Um, so now we're going to take a look at a couple examples to show how this progression may look. And I'll start by introducing a student named Sam. So although Sam is a fictitious student, his story is made up of different successes 
that the TAC is hearing from schools across the state of Montana. So Sam is 17 years old. He lives somewhere in rural Montana. His family lives on a ranch, and Sam participates in the daily routines, which includes a lot of working with his hands and physical labor. So some of his preferences include tinkering with tools, small social groups, and learning through hands-on experiences. Sam is a junior at the local high school. He's a student with a learning disability and has an IEP, which qualifies him to receive pre-ETS. Sam takes courses with his peers, and he receives special edu education services in both reading and math. So he's been riding the bus to school as he completes the final stages of his driver's license. And during this time, the school's pre -ETS team is trying to determine a way to provide Sam with an integrated work-based learning opportunity. This is a small town without a whole lot of employment opportunities, and the school doesn't have the funds to provide transportation to the next town over for its pre -ETS eligible students. So as staff provide Sam with job awareness and exploration counseling, the team decides to brainstorm local opportunities to help meet Sam's interests and preferences. So the teachers are also using during this time interviews and task observations to learn more about Sam's learning styles and his abilities. So all of this results in setting up a few local job shadows for careers Sam's interested in. So this might be at an implement dealer, a service station, and at a local welding shop. So Sam does the job shadows, and he does not care for the implement dealer one bit, nor the service station. But he was really intrigued with the welding shop. So the team moves on to setting up a paid work experience where the student is able to be part of the welding shop on a regular basis for two hours a week during the semester. And by this point, Sam has obtained his driver's license, which solves that transportation issue. And during his work-based learning experience, Sam and the team continue to assess the skills needed for the job. They also look for worksite training opportunities, and they reflect and discuss strengths and opportunities for growth. So preparing Sam for the skills needed becomes part of his learning objectives at school, as well as at the worksite. While Sam is working at the welding shop, he remains involved in other pre -ETS activities at school. So as mentioned previously, some of this might look like taking a financial literacy course to learn about the responsibilities and expectations now that he has a paycheck coming in. He may also take a VOC prep course to develop the self-management skills, such as problem identification, identifying tasks that need to be completed, um, determining the best possible outcomes, and selecting the best course of action. So Sam is provided instruction in self-advocacy with a focus on identifying and requesting accommodations. And he's also learning how to use those skills with assistive technology. So in this case, Sam is using his smartphone on a daily basis to help him manage his time, organize his tasks, and set reminders now that he has to go back and forth between school and work and home. So the soft skills course he takes helps him grow in communication and other workplace readiness skills. And for Sam, this includes a lot of those self-reflection pieces as well as self-monitoring. So throughout these courses, Sam has certain homework that he needs to complete that directly relates to his work-based learning experience. And some of this may include interviewing staff at the welding shop, the researching of trade programs, creating a resume, or requesting a letter of recommendation from his boss. And all of this information that he's been gathering is being captured through his profile on MCIS. So as the year moves on, other students at the school begin to voice interest in learning how to weld. So the school decides to approach the welder who has credentials and teaching experience to instruct a higher level welding course for interested students. So now students, including Sam, are able to receive additional training opportunities and receive school credit. Throughout the year, the welder really likes the work Sam has been doing, and he decides to offer him a paid position the summer of his senior year. On the school's end, they chose to use pre funds to pay for the wages for the work-based learning experience, and they orchestrated that through a temp agency, and it was paid above minimum wage. And the school also paid a portion of its pre funds to go towards staffing of the financial literacy course, the soft skills course, 
and the new welding program. So yay for Sam. Access to pre has allowed him to fully participate in career awareness, exploration, preparation, and training. So now would be a good time to probably ask Sam if he would be willing to mentor other students through the process in the next coming years. And Sam is just one example of how the continuum can support work-based learning. So we're going to take a look at a student who, who have, may have more intensive support needs. So I will pass on my mic. This is Roger Shelley. I appreciate everybody coming. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about Alexi. Now, Alexi has a rather severe developmental disability, which doesn't only come out as intellectual disability, but also in some ways is a, is a physical disability. She's very, very, very social, however. Um, sometimes, in, in some instances, too social. I mean, in some instances, she might be uh, what we might think of as inappropriately social with people she doesn't know. So she's 17 years old. She has a developmental disability and has been receiving pre-employment training services since she was 14. She, she's really lucky that she started that early. Um, in the earlier years, because of her, because of her sociability, um, uh, we needed to train her in, in soft skills. Okay? She, she needed to be able to react to, a, to an environment the way that is, is necessary to react in order to be part of that environment. So a lot of times we would have her training a lot of actually role modeling with teachers and other students in order for her to practice how she was to interact in a, in a certain environment. So that was, that was a big part of her, her early training was to be able to interact with environments and since she wasn't really very verbal and she didn't stand up for herself very well, some self, some self advocacy training. So the first, the first year or so, we worked basically on soft skills and self advocacy, mostly in the classroom, although we did have a nearby independent living center that came over that sent representatives over to talk to, to the students occasionally. And so some of the advocacy was actually provided by them. Another part of advocacy was an actual advocacy tr uh, club that was that was part of the school. So um, self-advocacy was was uh, supported by an outside agency as well as within the school itself. Job exploration counseling revealed that she had real interest and aptitude for social services employment. Um, the interesting thing about Lex was she wasn't because of her physical disabilities she wasn't really capable of doing any physical jobs. In fact, when she was around the campus and asked to do some, something like oh, a, a student job, uh, something like janitorial, uh, something like that, she wasn't really interested and she would basically, after, after a, a few minutes of doing it, would just basically refuse to do it anymore. So we kind of knew that that kind of stuff was out. We kind of took a look at her on indoors or outdoor types of jobs. Um, because of because of the physical disability, she really didn't wasn't suited very well for something outdoors. And then having having taken a look at her at her social services, her so, her social being, and her social services type of attitude, we started taking a look at how many outlets for social service were in this medium sized city. So job exploration con we started exploration counseling. And not only did it reveal that, but workplace readiness, taking a look at actual job interviews and actual job shadowing where she could use her, her uh, soft skills in an, actual, in an actual environment so she would be able to modify her soft skills in order to apply them to some of the different types of social service uh, environments that she job shadowed. One was uh, local HRDC. One was... Um, um, the the um, the local uh, one stop office. Um, one was um, the local housing office, the lo local HUD housing office, places like that, where she could use her skills in order to interact with the people that that were there. Um, okay, so she was an organization data network and some job shadowing from those interviews, work based learning experience were set up at three agencies operating in town. 
the goal was more to more clearly delineate the skills necessary for success. So she she was ready to go and interact within those environments because of the uh, soft skills and the self advocacy. She was the job exploration. She the interest and the aptitudes were taken a look at. She did job sh shadowing, and from job shadowing, she picked uh, three different agencies to go and actually take some more time in and not only do job shadowing, but actually have some work-based uh, work interaction with both the, the co-workers as well as the, the customers that were coming in. Um, she was very good at that. All three of them liked her very much. She had a real smooth way of talking. She was very capable of doing that kind of work, and she was a team player. She was able to assist and be a colleague to the other, to the other people that were working in that, in that setting. And then, then what we set up was counseling for post-secondary education, thinking, well, perhaps she has other things that she could be able to gather, some other traits, some other skills, some other people skills that she could gather through post-secondary education. And we put her into the different, um, the different venues for post-secondary. Um, the local community college was one. Um, and uh, adult education was one. Just seeing how she was able to fit in there and see if she could make choices, uh, console choices about some of the classes she might be able to take there. Um, so that's about where we are with her at the moment. We're still looking at more, um, at, at more uh, uh, work-based work learning experiences um, for her in the, in the future. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to be able to uh, to be able to more closely match her with the job or with a career that she would like to have and be successful in. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. Ellen D or Mary or Melissa or Roger, do any of you have anything you want to say about the resources that we have up on the slide? This is Mary. We just wanted to um, be able to provide the reference to the, the resource that we're suggesting um, could be used as part of the work-based learning um, progression. So, for example, we mentioned MCIS several times. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that website that's listed there is how to access that. There's a couple of different places where you can access soft skills curriculum for free, and they're listed. And then the Department of Labor information, Voc Rehab, and Mark Golden Associate information um, is listed there. So we just wanted to make those resources available to you. Great. Thank you. Do any of the presenters have any final things you want to say before we open it up for the questions and answers? I, f I forgot to add, this is Ellen, I forgot to add that our part two is going to focus on activities for counseling around post-secondary education and training and self-advocacy, and that is going to be on March 9th. Okay, great. And after the questions and answers, I have just a few final wrap-up remarks, and we'll, I'll also mention the March 9th webinar again. Um, so please do stay online until the questions and answers have finished. If you have any questions, just a reminder, look in the upper right-hand area of your screen, and you should see an orange box with a white arrow in it. If you click on that, it will open a window, and one of the options within that window is questions or chat, and you can type your question into that area. And then as the questions come in, we will read them aloud for the presenters to answer. We do have a few questions that have come in already, so I'll go ahead and start with these. Um, the first is a multiple part question. It says, my concern is threefold as a career coach. First, continually entering new students in the VR paperwork system as we receive them from the high school. Next, entering daily notes as we meet with a student and move them through the course strategies. And lastly, developing a career interest plan that may involve a job shadow to job experiences to discovering a class at a career center. But none of this is billable that I know of, or is it? 
Oh, and I think this is Teresa Stinson, and I believe that you are in Indiana. Um, so I'm not sure what Indiana is doing with Priets. In Montana, an agency could enter into a contract with vocational rehabilitation to provide those Priet services, or they could enter into a contract with the school to provide those um, services. So our information and technical assistance right now is particular to Montana and how we're doing things here, but it would be worth a conversation with Voc Rehab in your state. Great, thank you. Next question, and this one may need to go to VR, um, but you may have the answers as well. Just wondering if VR will change their perspective on the length of time it takes to set up a work-based learning site. This process will take much more than the 10 hours they currently give. And it looks like that's from Michelle Pacal, who's a, a community rehab program provider in uh, Missoula. And I think the contracts between CRPs and, and VR for Priets are, they're evolving right now. And so I think part of the discussion that the providers need to have with VR is what are the expectations, what is billable, um, what does that look like? And then also, how do schools and agencies work together? Because schools, schools have funding, they have resources, your VR counselors are attached to the schools, and you potentially have your rehab providers in those schools as well. So how do you all work together to, to put together services for that individual? Thank you. How do you handle workers' comp issues for work-based experiences? That, from my point of view, that depends on whether the school has somebody involved with the work-based experiences too. If the student, if the student and, a, and a, 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 a person that goes out with them, uh, the student should be covered by the school's workman's comp. Anybody else have anything to say about that? A lot of this has to do with who's paying for the work-based learning opportunity. So if the school is paying the wages, then the school would be responsible for the work comp. Um, it was mentioned on one of the case studies that the student did a work experience and the, the school went through a temp agency to provide the wages. In that case, the temp agency is the employer and they would provide the work comp and would factor that into the rate that they charge the school. So typically, it's whoever the employer is, and the employer is typically whoever is paying the wages. If, if, yes. And if the CRP that's contracted by VR or by the schools um, is around, on site with the person too, then, then the CRP, it, the person is, is uh, covered under the CRP's policy. Thank you. A couple of questions wrapped into one here. Are there currently laws mandating that employers take time out of their business hours to job shadow, provide informational interviews, and come into the schools to provide career exploration training? And along with that, have you interviewed employers to ask them what they think as far as what they're willing to do to help students succeed in the workforce? Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Well, I was just going to say a lot of this has to do with the relationship with the employer. There are not laws mandating that the employer has to provide a job shadow or a work experience. So that where that's why it needs to go back to the relationship with the employer that um, the employer then is just willing to provide that experience to the student. Um, because it's in the best interests of the student. Um, it's under Department of Labor regulations that the employer is not supposed to benefit from the student doing a job shadow or a work experience. It's for instructional purposes. Um, so again, it goes back to just developing those relationships and 
having it be a positive experience for the employer as much it is, as it is a positive and a learning experience for the student. Now, this is Roger again. And one of the other things, most employers want to give to their communities because that's what, uh, it's a marketing tool for them. They, get, they can get more business. And if you're thinking about doing this all by yourself, there are plenty of other of your colleagues that also do business in town somewhere that know, that know employers, that know business owners, that may be employed to help you get into that business owner and talk to them. So don't, don't think of yourself as the only person doing this. Think of all the people that you work with that can help you do it. Okay, thank you. Next question, as a job coach, which part of the process, if any, would we be involved in? Or does the school complete this entire process? I think that depends on how your school is doing pre-ets. Um, you know, some schools are doing it all themselves. Some schools are contracting with local providers. Some um, VR offices are contracting with local providers. It, it depends. So that would be a great conversation to have with the school and with the, the, VR, age, the VR counselor that's assigned to that school. Okay. Next question, are you going to provide tools for each phase or will these be tools we create within our agencies? You know, I think we have, in terms of uh, including students with more significant disabilities in pre we have several courses coming up, one-day one day sessions on, um, that will include the strategies of discovery, and it's all focused on students. So there are tools that we will offer there that people could use. We're also doing a, um, a session on discovery and age-appropriate transition assessments next week at the CEC conference. And there will be a list of strategies that, that you can use there. I think there's also things out there. And you know, Mary's developed a soft skills curriculum that's usable um, for Montana youth transitions. There's also lists of various tools um, in the guide to pre-employment transition services, the pie chart document. Okay. Thank you. The next one, um, House Bill 308, having been passed yesterday, providing employers with a $1,000 tax credit for apprenticeships should help with establishing employer relationships, especially useful for us as CRPs. Thoughts? Input? Well, the, um, with pre the whole focus is on preparation for careers and college. And there's a distinct line between preparation and training for a specific job that you're going into. And so apprenticeships are not part of pre -ads. So that's going to help as students are exiting and for adults. And if I'm misspeaking, Tammy Hogan, please jump in and save me. Just checking to see if Tammy's raising her hand because she would be muted, so. And I'm not seeing her there. I think she, if she's on, she's probably sitting with Misty Hoffland. Okay. Do you want to make any distinction between um, registered apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, and just straight out apprenticeships? I don't. Mary, do you? You know, I think that's something that we can um, can answer and, and email out at a later date. Um, as Ellen mentioned, under the guise of pre -eds, apprenticeships aren't part of that. Um, but I know that they're, through the Department of Labor, they're looking at how to 
obviously outside of the pre-ETS world, how to implement more access to apprenticeship. And so a big piece of that is when you're working with high school students, what can they develop for pre-apprenticeship to help students get ready for those careers while they're in high school. So um, I think that's the most distinction I can make at this point, Kim, but, um, but it is something to watch, as Ellen mentioned, as a tool for our students um, outside of the world of pre -ets, but also the students as they're exiting high school and what they can access. Thank you. Mary, is there, is, Mary, is there any way that this could be part of post-secondary counseling? Um, certainly, I think it could be. Okay. So stay so, tuned for that March uh, webinar. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next question. In visiting with one potential employer, they had questions about students under 18 being able to work. They were under the impression that labor laws excluded students under 18 from working. That is not the case. Um, there's some clearly stated guidelines by the U.S. Department of Labor on one one page fact sheets. And um, Kim, I'm not sure if it's possible how, how we can send that information out, but we can send links to those um, if you would like that. Also, if you um, just do a Google search, you can get to those, those fact sheets as well. But there are labor laws that specify what age groups of youth can do. So for example, there's labor laws specifically for students 14 and younger, for the categories of 14 and 15, and then 16 and older, and then 18 and older. So there are stages it's a progression of its own <laughs> in terms of what youth can do and what they can um, not do. Um, but there are many types of jobs and many, um, many occupations that youth can access. Thank you. And we just had a comment come in from Kelly McNerland. Thank you very much, Kelly. And she says, um, that we will have a segment on apprenticeships in May at the Disability Employment Conference, May 2nd through 4th in Helena. Details coming soon. So be watching for that. And thanks again, Kelly, for, for sharing that information. Next question, and just a reminder, and Ellen mentioned this as well, but the information being shared today is Montana specific. So if you're joining us from another state, be sure to check the answers with your state VR representatives and with whoever is handling pre-employment transition services technical assistance in your state. Um, this question, if a student has a physical disability and goes to a public school but has no 504 or IEP, can they still receive pre-ET services? And if so, how can they engage in these services? They, they could be potentially eligible for voc rehab. And so if it's somebody in a Montana school, um, ideally they have been identified. And Ellen, I think it's also important to note that not every high school in Montana has um, established a contract with voc rehab yet. So it's also important to to determine if, if your student goes to a high school that has a pre ETS contract. Good point. So the other, the other avenue for pre ETS is contacting your local Vogue Rehab office. And students can receive pre ETS through Vogue Rehab even if their school does not yet have a contract. Thank you. Any other questions from any of the audience members? And while we're waiting for people to type in any last questions that, may, that they may have, um, do any of the presenters have final comments or thoughts that you want to share? I don't think so. Thank you, Kim. Okay. 
And I'm just looking, there is a, a question about um, asking for a link for the Youth Employment Conference. Um, and if you're referring to the, the Disability Employment Conference, I don't have a link for that right now. Um, Kelly, if you have a link, would you mind putting it in in your chat box? No, no link yet. Still setting it up. Thank you very much, Kelly, for your quick reply. And actually, Kelly, as soon as there is a link, if you email it to Kim Brown, she will share that information through our listserv. Our, and if you're not part of our Prietz listserv, you can join it by going to the DPHHS website. Okay, well just a few final comments. Um, re a reminder that a short survey will pop up on your screen when you log out of today's webinar. Please do take the time to complete that survey. As Ellen mentioned, part two of today's session, preparing youth with disabilities for, uh, preparing students with disabilities, excuse me, for careers in college through an evolution of pre activities part two will take place on March 9th, and that will address counseling on opportunities for enrollment in post-secondary education and instruction in self-advocacy. The flyer and the registration link for that webinar will be going out in the next week, and it will be sent to all of the Prietz online mailing list members. Um, the recording for today's webinar will be posted to the Voc Rehab and Blind Services YouTube channel. The URL for that is up on your screen in front of you right now, and it does take a couple of weeks to get that up, but do be watching for it and share that with others who were not able to attend today. And I would like to thank all of our excellent presenters today for the information that you shared. I'd also like to thank Brenda Fredenberg, who was a co-organizer of today's webinar and um, has been helping to moderate in the background. And I'd like to thank all of our audience members for taking the time to join us and to ask questions and to learn more about Prietz. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.